In this episode of the Smart Community Podcast, I have a brilliant chat with Ryan McManus, the founder and CEO of Share Mobility, a mobility company that helps organizations and cities solve big transport problems with their mobility platform. Ryan and I met on my trip recently to Columbus, Ohio, which was in 2020 in January. I met Ryan at a meeting with Smart Columbus, where I learned about the work they are doing. Now, obviously, this episode was recorded before the coronavirus became a pandemic, and currently Share is repurposing their shared transport network and customer support staff to serve the needs of the people who are staying at home. I'll just read this um, quote from their website. Share is responding to shelter-in-place orders by repurposing our shared transport network and customer support staff to serve the delivery needs of people that are staying at home. We will be working with organisations to collect orders and assign them to drivers for fulfilment in 75 cities. So on the topic of COVID-19, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an update of what our team is doing to respond. So our team was virtual. Um, the majority was virtual and will remain this way. And we are following the health advice and following hygiene and social distancing precautions. And for now, the podcast will continue as per usual while the situation continues to develop. But down the track, um, once there's a bit more data, we anticipate on doing a few episodes on this pandemic. Anyway, we'll see. But in the meantime, we will continue to provide you with regular content to entertain and educate you. So if you're finding yourself with more time on your hands than usual, remember we have a wonderful backlog of episodes for your listening pleasure. Now, as my good friend and brilliant podcast producer, Ellen Ronalds Keane, has reminded us, podcasts are a community service at this time. So we will continue to be of service right now because we might need a little break and that's okay. Right now we might feel like we need to be connected with something that before this before this pandemic happened and that's okay. Right now we might want to just feel, you know, a little bit normal and that's okay. So if you're looking for a particular non-corona related topic that we could cover, reach out on the socials and we'll see what we can do because we love you. So my community friends, uh, sending virtual hugs your way. Now, more than ever, it's time to be smart and making our technology work for us so that we can actually stay human. So we use it to work as we need to for us and our teams and be able to adapt as the needs change. We can use it to consume credible information from credible sources and stay up to date with the latest advice and switch off from the channels that aren't serving us right now. We can use it to be kind. Understand that we may need to do things differently for a while and reach out to those who might find themselves isolated or vulnerable. So be smart so that we can stay human. And when we come out of the other side of this, and we will, smart communities and our human connections will continue to be so important and even more so. So I think we'll see some changes. But that's enough from me at the moment on that topic. So we're going to move into this episode and just remember that we recorded this before the pandemic. But after we come out of this, it will be so important that we are continuing this conversation and continuing to build these smart communities. In this episode, Ryan and I discuss his interest in cars and innovation and how he brought concepts of IoT and the automotive industry together to create SHARE. We talk about how SHARE works and the gap they are fulfilling that is different from both public transit and from what ride-sharing companies were providing. Ryan tells us what a smart community means to him, and how we can integrate mobility into our communities. We discuss some of the projects Ryan has been working on and the different ways organisations are working together in Columbus to solve mobility problems and the benefits of working in the Smart Columbus ecosystem. We finish our chat talking about the emerging trends of the opportunity for improvement when it comes to insurance in the mobility space, as well as the ever important topic of data being used for public good. So stay safe, stay well, stay connected and look after each other. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart region, smart cities it's where we live work and play with smart communities the future starts today big data smart mobility emerging trends galore the 
the Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. Hello, Ryan. How are you today? I'm doing great, Zoe. Thanks for having me. That's awesome to hear. I'm excited to have you. Let's jump straight in. And can you tell us about your background and what you are passionate about? Absolutely. So now I'm the CEO of Share Mobility. And, you know, I got here very much because of my interest in cars and innovation. Um, I had an opportunity early in my career to get to kind of work in um, innovation and and areas of change in industry. And so um, I was really interested in the automotive industry and wanted to find ways to get involved and I I was also really interested in internet of things and connected devices. And I saw the connected car as like this, this amazing connected device that was going to completely change the way we live. And I just wanted to be a part of that. Um, And so that uh, led me to uh, an opportunity uh, to be able to start this company and uh, get to work in mobility in a kind of a different angle where we use vehicles to move people, but um, it's status it satisfies my interest in working in the automotive industry. Yeah, cool. So tell us how you brought um, the IoT and the automotive industries kind of together in your mind. Yeah, so, um, you know, I saw the car was going to be producing a, a huge amount of data, and that data was going to be able to make the car go from something that sits in our driveway, you know, 95% of the time to to something that um, can be used to create almost universal availability of transportation if it was shared correctly. And uh, it was kind of that idea about how data and and the uh, eventually an autonomous vehicle would be used that led me to kind of create this first idea that I that I pitched to Jaguar Land Rover in 2016 about um, autonomous vehicle experiences. And that ultimately gave me, you know, a little bit of time to think about um, th- this industry and what opportunities there were for somebody in Columbus, Ohio to, to be a part of it. And so that, uh, you know, I've spent um, about a year and a half ultimately building some software and um, meeting a lot of people to think about how I could bring a connected vehicle solution to a group of people that had had transportation problems that I was able to learn about um, when I was the in, the entrepreneur in residence at Smart Columbus. And um, there were huge gaps in availability to transportation that I saw, and it was only after. Um, spending a lot of time with automakers and and other other you know members of the community that had transportation issues that I was able to see that you know there was um, needs beyond what public transit was able to do and what Uber and Lyft and uh, other ride sharing options were providing um, and so we got a couple of vehicles in 2017 and uh, put some connected devices in them, dash cameras, and and started tracking driver behavior and ultimately used all of that to help people get to work and school and healthcare. And that's now what we do every day at Share. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about um, when you say tracking driver behavior, uh, what type of things were you looking at and, and what, um, you know, what was the outcome or the purpose of that? So one of the things I heard from a lot of groups when they would talk about their needs for transportation was that they needed something they could trust. And um, the the data that was going to be coming from the vehicle and the dash camera, that was going to allow us to track drivers in a way that was um, not done in other ride sharing businesses, right? Um, it wasn't just like, is this person speeding? It was, we could tell if a driver was touching their phone while they were driving at any point and use that data to um, change the driver's behavior and result in the highest industry safety performance, which we could then show to the customers to prove that we were delivering this leading safety uh, transportation service. And so the connected vehicle data was to, to create trust within our, our customer base. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. And 
tell us a little bit about, uh, share a little bit more. I'm keen to hear, do you have larger vehicles? So you, it's more um, pooling and uh, rather than, you know, a single occupancy ride? Absolutely. I mean, it's in the name, right? So yeah. share, the, the whole concept is try to get as many people as possible that can ride together while still making it a, a really good experience and not take too long, but also not be trying to do what exactly what public transit was doing. So we use vehicles that have between six seats and 24 seats. Um, we average uh, you know, around seven people per, per trip sharing rides. So, um, you know, we have really good density that we create. We have routes that do have as many as 24 people on them. Um, but the unique thing about share is that we're only available through an organization. So you, you get access to share because your employer offers us or your healthcare provider offers us or the community you live in introduces it to you and then, then you can join. So it's not open to just anybody. And then when you get access to share, there's limited destinations that you can go to. So you can't schedule a ride from anywhere to anywhere. You could, depending on where you're going, you can either get picked up at, at your front door or you might have to meet at one of our virtual bus stops, which we call flex stops. And then you're gonna plan your ride in advance. So um, it's at least 12 hours uh, in advance. You're, you're planning your share ride. And it takes less than two minutes in our app to schedule an entire month of rides. And we've designed the service to be for the trips you take the most. And so um, somebody will learn about Share through their employer. They will download the app and they can use their employer email address and they automatically get access to the transportation services that their employer is offering to them as a benefit. Um, and like 95% of our riders do not pay for their ride. It's, it's provided for them as a benefit. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that makes it really great. Um, so we're asking people to change their behavior in a few ways. We're asking them to plan ahead for this trip. Um, we're asking them to share a ride, but in exchange, we give them productivity. Um, we reduce their environmental impact. We save them a ton of money. Um, you know, the average rider is saving like 5,000 US dollars a year or more if they took it every day. And uh, we're averaging over 25 rides a month uh, that people are taking with us. So they're really looking at their commute and saying, I wanna do this differently. And um, by making it really, really easy to schedule and plan your ride, we're getting people to change their behavior. And so the impact that I'm trying to make on a smart city is to show people that if they, if they can, use a mobility service more, then that's going to allow traffic to go down, it's going to allow environmental impact to go down, and ultimately it's going to allow new connected, assisted, and eventually fully autonomous vehicles to be a primary mode of, of, of moving around. Um, but it's that behavior change that I think is so needed in our cities right now, and because we're so car dependent, and um, that that is one of the things that I believe will make autonomous vehicles take longer to become, um, you know, kind of mainstream. But if more people were to use mobility services, it would allow for these technologies to 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 be introduced into the market much much faster. Mm, yeah, I mean, you talked a little bit about um, how that fits into a smart city. So let's go there and tell us what. Um, a smart city and the term I use is smart community which I think is uh, moving past that city focus and then um, you know being able to incorporate regional areas but then also focusing on the people so I'll leave it up to you whichever term you would like to use um, what does that actually mean to you yeah like, well I really like the term smart communities because I think it's it's act to be able to see the impact it needs to be really like community focused very local and that's the way that people are going to learn about these new technologies and new services. And that's why they're going to try them um, because someone in their local community is introducing it to them. Um, when I think about a smart city, I think about it as an industry and how it encompasses, 
you know, everything from smart street lights to new mobility services and scooters to using data to improve food access in a community. Um, and all of those things are kind of working together with data as, as a foundational element to make these things work better and to make cities work better, to make community work better. And all of it should be for the purpose of creating equity and not to, to, because it's a buzzword, but because I think that's all ultimately what a successful smart city accomplishes is it takes the assets of a community and it uses data to figure out who needs them and how to best allocate it and how to move it around with Amazon style efficiency to make sure that everybody has what they need. And it, when it's, when it all works, it's going to be really beautiful. Um, but it's going to come down to these communities adopting it and getting people to use it and participate in any new project, whether it's, you know, a, an initiative to ride the bus more or putting smart meters on your home to better monitor, you know, electricity usage. Uh, all of that is part of a smart city to me or a smart community. Mm. I'm keen to hear, you know, we're talking about autonomous vehicles um, b before and, you know, being kind of the, the ultimate. For when we talk about community, um, I feel like, and particularly America and Australia have this, you know, love affair with, with the vehicle um, and, you know, we, can, we continue to do so. Are you seeing a future where we've, we've switched uh, our love affair with, you know, drive, a car that we drive to one that, you know, now drives itself? But have we actually changed our, um, you know, behaviour, I suppose, to have less vehicles, more, more space for walking, cycling, um, increasing that public transport as well? What are your thoughts about how we can integrate mobility, I guess, into our communities and not just be about uh, your private vehicle, whether it's autonomous or not? Yeah. So great question. I think you can separate the love affair people have with driving um, and our need to move to kind of a shared autonomous future. Um, you know, people will be able to enjoy driving in you know some capacity for a very, very long time. But the need to move to, you know, in a shared autonomous future, I think is so important because if we get to a world of autonomous vehicles and everyone is still using their own device it's a bring your own device world and everybody has their own autonomous car it's the hell scenario of the roads where there's m more cars than people out on the roads and there's a bunch of them empty doing errands and they're not being optimized because the it, the choice was left to the individual i think that the first autonomous vehicles are going to be like plasma screens from 20 years ago or 15 years ago when they cost an astronomical amount of money when they first came out. Um, autonomous vehicles should cost a lot more. Therefore, I believe they're going to be centrally owned and shared in the beginning because they will have to be because of their cost and also because of just their usefulness. Um, that's a fully autonomous vehicle, right? One that can, can operate without a pilot um, one that, you know, can, can work in every scenario, but, you know, before that happens, there's, there has to be fewer cars that can't talk to each other on the road. So we have to get those vehicles off the road before the, any autonomous vehicle is going to, I, I think, truly be able to operate. If we don't learn to share our vehicles, even if it's a personal ride, you're riding in it by yourself. If, if we can't get over the need for that thing to sit in our driveway, um, I think it's going to take so much longer to get autonomous vehicles that that we're going to be really disappointed in what 20 years from now looks like. So um, it, we have to learn to be able to share our vehicles if if we want to see a future where we have less of them. Yeah, and I think also that changing behavior that you were talking about is obviously a key part in that not only just sharing but um you know increasing mobility through 
not just, you know, getting in a vehicle, but like you said, you know, even when you're setting up your um, flex uh, stops, you know, people having to get up, go, you know, walk down the street or, or ride down the street or whatever, and then getting on something that's different to what they they used to but then getting them used to that and i think providing it from a uh i guess your um your main trips are they commuting uh trips so you know to and from work it's the biggest part of our business is for people going to work um i define the commute broadly uh to be any place you're going on a regular repeated basis you know so you can commute to school uh, a dialysis appointment or to your job. Mm. So there's, you know, you could be commuting to a different, you know, a number of places. What our riders are doing is they're consistently going to the same place and they're booking, you know, the same type of ride. Not, not in every case, but a majority of our rides are that, you know, I'm going to take this 20 times, 30 times, 40 times this month to go to someplace. And are you seeing that um, a majority of your riders, what would the majority of your riders have done if they didn't have this service? So would they have taken, you know, the, their vehicle or a bus or, you know, that type of thing? What, what are the trips replacing? So it's kind of three things for us. It's for a certain segment of our riders, it's a, tr- it's a trip that is otherwise given by a caregiver or someone in the family. So they're being driven, right? And so they rely on others to be able to get transportation. The biggest segment of our riders is they were driving a car by themselves and, and they were single occupancy vehicles on the road commuting and they were driving by themselves. And the third is individuals that otherwise would not get there. There was not an option for transportation. Without it, they would not be able to take this job. And so it's so powerful for an employer to be able to say, do you need transportation? Here's the solution. Here's your option. We can, we can recruit and hire in any neighborhood now because we have a mobility option that can reach into any neighborhood. And you're going to be able to say, here's a bus pass. This is going to work. Or here's a share ride. That's what's going to work best for you. Okay, I'm keen to dive into the projects and things that you've currently been working on, um, obviously, particularly with uh, Smart Columbus, where we met. Yeah, so Columbus is kind of looked at as uh, creating the model of, a, of an American smart city. Um, and we're, We've got some great public-private partnerships that have been really instrumental in getting organizations in the private sector to start participating in mobility. And uh, what what Cher has been doing um, on the you know employer side is really working on commuter benefits programs and getting employers for the first time to do what Google has been doing for a decade. You know, I read an article today about four thousand people going to one Facebook office and buses every day. You know, and in the Midwest, uh, you know, in Ohio and Indiana, it's very rare for companies to even offer the ability to buy a bus pass pre-tax or to know how they're going to do that. So getting the employers to participate in these commuter benefits has been really instrumental. And now we've got four of the 10 largest companies in the city that have various mobility services with share that they offer to their employees to help them stop driving. And the reason to do that could be because they've got a parking crunch or they're looking at having to build more parking, or they can't recruit, they can't get people to work at, at a location because it's outside of you know the bus line. It's outside. It's very far to drive. Um, you know, there's a variety of different reasons why companies are doing it, but you know, we're showing how an employer can take a role in introducing mobility, just like they introduce healthcare, and saying, all right, now here's a better option for you to get to work and we're willing to also uh, share the cost. Mm. Now that's so important. And I think it is definitely a, like a flick um, switch, you know, that we're, we're, we're thinking about mobility in different ways. And I really enjoyed, um, you know, having the, the meeting that we have with all the different partners as well. So it, it does really show that it's so integrated. So 
you know, obviously you guys are there as somebody offering a service, but then, you know, right across the table, table, you've got the transit agency. So it's not like you're in competition and you're not talking to each other and, you know, you're uh, fighting with each other or anything like that. It's actually, well, how do we do this together? Because we know how important it is um, and how important mobility is for not only, uh, you know, this, the, the people that you're serving, but also for the the city and and you know the workforce and there's so many things that are integrated together and I so I really enjoyed it. I think that's something really special that we have going on in Columbus uh, about how all the different organizations are working together. Um, I, I think it's because we all recognize that there's so much opportunity um, that no one could do it all and there's. Um, areas for each of us to be best and to solve a problem and to kind of share in this huge opportunity to change the way people are moving. And um, I think it's really important for anybody that's working in, in mobility to kind of say like, look, we have to have um, a positive impact on transit as we are creating opportunity for ourselves. Um, because the, I, I look at mobility as this ecosystem and it has like a fixed cost and and right now the fixed cost is really really high because we're all driving our own cars we're all buying gas and things individually and we're not riding transit as much as we could be and should be um, and it's not working efficiently and if we can move to a world where people are sharing their rides more sharing those vehicle assets more and planning some of these trips the total cost of the mobility ecosystem is going to come way down that's going to enable even more access because it's going to cost less and the environmental impact in the, in the meanwhile is going to be absolutely enormous and i think it's one of the reasons why a shift to a, a shared electric autonomous future is not just like good but essential to our cities mm. what's the biggest benefit you've you've gotten out of working in this kind of smart columbus ecosystem so i think it's um the awareness that was created amongst employers to take action not just to learn about it but to take action and to say like all right we're gonna we're gonna be the advocates to do these new things and we're going to spend time learning about them and then we're going to spend time educating our people. Um, it's a cost that a lot of the employers had to bear. It's, it's a kind of cost that doesn't show up in any budget. It's kind of hard to identify, but it was a commitment of resources that was coordinated and, you know, championed by smart Columbus. And as a, as a mobility startup in, in Columbus, we were able to benefit from that greatly uh, because it it encouraged participation it encouraged the private sector to do to do something and to, and to do it in a big way um, and I think that's one of the things that makes Columbus's public private partnerships so special um, is because it's you know the, the city doing their part and the, the employers and the businesses kind of pushing it all in the same direction mm. yeah I think that's really important that direction and you know I guess the vision of of where we're going we have to have the same the same direction at least and we may have different ideas of how to get there but that's where you know that integration piece and um collaborating together and and i like what you said about it's not just about continuing to learn because i think you know there's lots of stuff out there that's okay let's learn more about this you know um and learn 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 I, I think we continue to need to learn, but we need to take action, right? We can't learn absolutely everything. We need to give it a go. We need to try. We need to um, learn from our, our lessons, but also learn from other people's lessons. But as soon, uh, as, until you do it yourself, um, you can't possibly you know, get it 100% right each time. So I think that's really key. And I think that's from a government perspective. It's, it's a different mindset, a different way of thinking. Um, and I think that's really important in moving forward in the space and that's what i really liked about smart columbus was bringing those people together and also making a kind of a a point a central point with all these different nodes so if you like i knew that i would go to smart columbus because they're smart columbus and then they were able to identify the people that i would be interested with and make introductions and then i was able to meet a whole bunch of other people that you know just made my trip 
um, amazing. But it's really important for um, you know people looking in to know where to go to actually start these conversations. So I thought that was another key area as well. Totally. I mean, they're the navigator, right? Uh, we, we're lucky that we got to meet you and because you were coming in and we, we've gotten to do that in, in a lot of, of different ways. And so Columbus is a, a place to come to learn and they, they, are a, a, they are the first stop if you want to learn about what's going on in our smart city. Mm. And then also see yeah what actions they're actually taking. Like I was um, lucky enough to take, I took the the bus out um, to uh, Linden um, to show. They show me where you know the new uh, autonomous shuttle is going to be. And what I loved is that they're putting it in a neighbourhood um, where it will actually be useful and it will be a you know a key part of that community. And they built it with the community as well, um, which I just think is so important. And that shuttle is now rolling. It just started uh, in the last few days. So, yeah, that that's one of the many really great projects we have going on. Yeah, I really like that because it uses, like, it's that education piece which you talked about, but it's action, right? It's, it's you know, it's getting people used to the, the that idea and and getting people using that. But it's actually a real service that is going to benefit people and. Um, you know, the people told Smart Columbus um, and the team and, you know, the collaborators where they wanted it to go. You know, they wanted it to go to the community centre and, and other and other stops. It wasn't just somebody in an office somewhere deciding that, you know, the most effective route would be, you know, somewhere that, you know, no one would actually use because they're not the people on the ground. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, it comes down to the community. And then I think if they're involved in the planning they're going to be involved in the participation Mm -hmm. okay well let's talk about the future now and i'm keen to hear your thoughts about emerging trends so what are some of the emerging trends that you're seeing that maybe aren't being talked about enough well it's it's tough to say like this is going to be something that's not talked about i think this industry is actually something that's really well covered like there's a lot of people providing um their input and and focus. And so there's lots to to be able to look at. But, you know, I think from a mobility perspective, um, I think one of the things that's not being talked about enough is insurance's impact on mobility and how there's a huge need slash opportunity um, on the insurance side to get ready for these shared autonomous um, vehicles and be able to work with companies that are that are working in emerging technologies you know i i just look at like the availability of wheelchair enabled vehicles and see that you know just the the insurance cost is one of the reasons why there's a lack of capacity and so if we want to share solve this access thing um you know i think insurance is something that that isn't being talked about enough um in this space and i think it's a huge opportunity for for improvement Mm -hmm. you know the other thing i think is um data in cities in regards to um, public records requests and and public records rules. So, you know, there's a, there's a hesitancy on the private sector, um, whether it's businesses or individuals in sharing data with cities, because there's a gray area about what is public information um, and, and um, requestable. Um, You know, it's not that way in every country. But I think establishing the rules of the game up front for how this data can be collected, how private information can be protected, and how it's going to be used for the betterment of a community, I think that needs to be talked about in a very public way, where you know it might be talked about among smart city circles, but I don't think the general public is involved in that conversation enough. But when you get together a group of you know, 50 people in a, in a town hall meeting to talk about new technology, you know, what are you doing with my data is always a question. So I think that's something that uh, needs to be at the forefront of conversation around smart cities is, is how we're going to be uh, sharing and using a lot of this data. And then, you know, I think the thing that, the other thing that I, I don't think is really being talked about is, You know, automotive companies are talking about an autonomous future. They're building for mobility. But if you look at vehicle projections in 2030, they're selling a lot more of them than they do today. And 
I think that mis mismatch is an anomaly in the market that needs to to be figured out because I don't think we can have both. Um, you know, an autonomous future and a future where you know we make more vehicles than we do in 2020. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting, okay. and particularly the the data um, side of things. I'm I'm really keen to dive a bit deeper into that, and and yeah, like you said, have these conversations with the public because you and I can talk about it, but unless you really are sharing that um, and and involving the community in that conversation, it'll it'll stop then in its tracks when we actually have to have those conversations publicly. Um, and also it's about their data, right? Um, and I think there is a way that we can have the smart cities and uh, further to that, the smart community approach, which is actually about bringing it back to the people. So who, like rather than collecting data on people, we're collecting data on things for the betterment of people, um, which is uh, a flip that I have been reading about recently that is actually quite powerful because um, then we can start having some of these conversations without it being, yeah, moving the, 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 the old narrative of smart city, which I think people are, get people gets people really concerned about their privacy, security, um, you know, that surveillance type of approach. We need to shift that conversation because that's, well, as far as I can see, that's not the future that we're actually wanting and, people like you and I that are in the space, um, that's not the future we necessarily want either. And I don't, I don't want to talk for you on that. Um, but, you know, we want the future where the humans are still at the center of this. Oh, totally. I mean, I want to live in the smart city that I'm trying to create, right? So I'm, I'm a, a, as interested in making sure these decisions are all made um, for, for the best, in, in the best interest of our community. And I think when you look at the whole of organizations working in it, they truly are just collecting data on things. It, it, that's a, that's a really good, um, good description of what's actually happening and it should make people feel more comfortable. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that we just haven't had. Um, it's a really great article. I've, I've been re I've been reading um, a lot of things that kind of have that same theme, and it's something I've been talking about for a while. Um, this particular article really um, spelt it out, um, so I can put a link to that, uh, which is yeah, flipping that from um, really thinking about people. What's the line in there is in the article is um, thinking of people as sensors, sensors rather than things to be sensed. Um, which which I also liked because it's about we are giving information, we're opting in to give some information, but it's for the benefit of us as the community. And, and like you said, the people that want to live in these um, smart communities. Yeah, that's great. I mean, keep keep the terms and conditions very, very simple, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think we could have a whole nother podcast on on, on just um yeah, moving like the data and the privacy and and what that future will look like. Um, because I'm really, I'm really excited to be involved. Um, and and I guess the other thing what I talk about a lot is that if we don't want this dystopian future or, or we're not um, comfortable with the way that things are moving, we can't step back. We actually need to step in and be involved and, and shape what this future will look like because it's not set. Really well said. Um, you know, my hope for the people involved in a smart city, you know, the, the, the community is that there's resilience and an accept, like you said earlier, like not everything is going to work an acceptance of failure of some of these new things that we're trying and um, be willing to try the next new thing because it's going to take participation and resilience for this stuff to ultimately uh, work. In innovation is not a straight path. It's, it's a, a windy road. And now we've got so much data, we're straightening it out. And so we're going to learn a lot faster than ever before. Um, it's, a, it's a really exciting time to be working in a city and working in change and working in mobility. Mm -hmm. Well, Ryan, it's been so great to chat with you. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Zoe, thank you so much for having me. This was a great conversation. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, me too. Um, one last question. How can people connect with you? So I'm fairly easy to find on Twitter. It's uh, Ryan McManus without any vowels, R-Y-N-M-C-M-N-S. Um, or if you go to ridewithshare.com and go to the live chat, uh, they'll connect you with me. Um, you can go to our website on the bottom right. There's a, there's a live chat. And so 
Um, I'm really looking forward to getting to meet more cities and, and get out and learn about different transportation problems and communities and see how Share can help this year. Excellent. Well, thank you again for coming onto the podcast. And I really look forward to having another conversation in the near future. Um, I really enjoyed my time in Columbus and it was really great to meet you. So yeah, we'll definitely keep in touch. Well, Columbus enjoyed having you. We'll have you back anytime and uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks again. We'll talk soon. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at SmartComHQ. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes. So thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.